For more on this, I'm joined by our political panel. We have Labor's Matt Thistlethwaite, of course, the shadow minister uh, for the Treasury. And uh, also we have Michael Suker, a Liberal MP as well in our Melbourne studio. Gentlemen, thanks both for your time this morning. Thank Michael Suker, if I can start with you. Thanks, this call from Cory Bernardi, it comes in the wake of two attempts within Parliament to have foreign donations banned, both by Labor, both voted against by the Coalition. Well, look, I think Cory... Um Corey makes a good point. I think we should look into the, uh, the question of foreign donations. But just let's remember here with Sam Dastiari, uh, this is not a conventional donation. This is Sam Dastiari asking uh, an entity associated with a foreign government uh, to pay for him a private debt. So this isn't uh, conventional fundraising. Uh, so I think we can put that to one side and say, yes, look, let's have a debate about foreign donations. We've seen uh, certainly the influence that foreign donations have had more broadly on Sam Dastyari and they've certainly had a lot of influence on his position on the South China Sea. Uh, but this is not a conventional donation. This is Sam Dastyari asking an entity associated with a foreign government to pay a private debt that he had uh, himself um, uh, was unable to pay, presumably. Uh, so. I think we need to separate the two and uh, I would uh, agree with Corey and I certainly did agree with Corey Bernardi last week when we called on Sam Dastyari to do the right thing and resign from the shadow front bench, certainly resign as the manager of opposition business in the Senate and if he's not decent enough okay. to do that then Bill Shorten must show the leadership and stand him down immediately. You said this wasn't within conventions, it is an entirely legal above the board declared donation here. So. If you're saying that this really is a, a particular donation you have an issue with, does that not highlight that you would agree with Cory Bernardi that perhaps you need to just ban all foreign political donations? Well, well Tom, we don't know it's above the board. Above the board. We, we don't know that. We know so few details. Sam Dastyari made a statement in the Senate uh, explaining this so-called donation, and that statement was 66 words in length. We have no idea whether this was above the, above the board or not. What we do know is that it was a payment to discharge a private obligation of Sam Dastyari. We've since seen that Sam Dastyari has stood in the blue room at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Offices of all places, presumably purporting to be speaking on behalf of the Australian Government, saying that the South China Sea has nothing to do with us and we don't, shouldn't have a view on it, in contravention of his policy and formal Australian government policy. So, Tom, I don't think we know this is above the board. There are so well, many know... questions that are unanswered. There are absolutely so Just many questions. Just briefly before I go to Matt Thistlethwaite, though, we know it was above board in terms of it was declared, wasn't it? Well, it was declared, certainly declared, but we have no idea who asked for the payment, how the payment was made, okay. uh, what, were, what the events were that precipitated the payment, because uh, Sam Dastyari made a 66-word statement. Uh, so you okay. and I, Tom, uh, Matt, don't know much wait. about it. Matt Thistlewaite, if I can get your thoughts on this. We haven't yet, have we, had an explanation, for example, on why Sam Dastyari was giving a position which since uh, senior Labor figures have admitted was in contrast to Labor's position on the South China Sea. Well, in the wake of that, Sam's come out and said that he supports the Labor Party's policy, and that is to abide by a rules-based system of dealing with disputes associated uh, with the South China Sea and internationally, and that the Chinese government should accept the outcome of the International uh, Court of Justice um, in respect of the Philippines' claim. That's a position that the Labor Party holds. It's a position that the Australian government um, holds. So in that respect, uh, we're at one. But in respect of uh, Sam's um, issue here, he's fully declared the donation. Uh, he made a statement to the Senate, so he's fully uh, complied with all of the rules. And really, it does highlight the need for some reform when it comes to overseas donations. And I agree with Corey Bernardi, I agree with Craig Laundie, that we should ban overseas donations. And this is the policy of the Labor Party. The last minister that attempted to introduce such a law was John Faulkner when he was the Special Minister of State. We introduced the legislation and we couldn't get it through the Parliament because the Liberal Party voted against it or indicated they were voting against it. So it's Labor that's tried to 
reform donation laws. We also should be reducing the disclosure threshold. It's ridiculous that you can donate $11,500 to a candidate or a party and not have to disclose it. We should be reducing that okay. limit as well. Just on this issue, though, you say Sam Dastier is on the same page he is now uh, as the rest of the party, but do you think an explanation is needed as to why he wasn't, that these comments that he's quoted as saying were not in keeping with the party's policy in the wake of this donation? Well, in the wake of last week's revelations, he's done that. He's come out and said that he supports the Labor Party's policy, um, which is the same as but, the government's. Sorry, but Matt, but he's never, he's <clears throat> never said why he didn't in that time, why he was quoted as not supporting at that time. Well, I, I disagree. I think he's, uh, he's fully explained that um, he, he was making those comments, uh, but he, he supports the Labor Party's position. So I think um, in that respect, he's at one with with the party uh, on this particular issue and, and our position is very, being, being made quite clear by numerous ministers, by our leader and that's we, that we support a rules based mechanism and that China should abide by the recent decision of the International Court. If I could get your one final question on to you Michael Sucre on this, uh, Labor's pointing out that Julie Bishop, the Foreign Minister, accepted in the past an iPad airfares and accommodation from a Chinese owned company. Um, is that a problem for a foreign minister? Does that again highlight, as I said, maybe the need for broader reform in this area? Well, this is a complete diversion, Tom. Uh, I can tell you right now, of the 150 or so members of uh, our federal lower house, most of them will have uh, undertaken some overseas travel supported by uh, entities overseas. Uh, and that's on both sides of politics. But what I'm not aware of is any single MP other than Sam Dastiari getting a company associated with a foreign government to pay a private bill. Just like me, um, overspending on my credit card and asking somebody associated with a, with a foreign government to pay it for me. Uh, if Matt can identify any person other than Sam Dastiari that's done that, I'd be surprised. And this is a big diversion. I give Labor credit. They certainly circle the wagons around their own, but uh, one thing is certain, Sam Dastyari will have to step down. It will either be this week or next week, and I would be calling on Bill Shorten to show the leadership required of somebody who aspires to be Prime Minister and step him down today. Final word from you, Matt Thistlethwaite. Uh, do you think he will need to be cut loose eventually? Well, as you point out, uh, the Foreign Minister uh, has received quite substantial donations uh, from foreign companies um, and Chinese interests. Uh, her particular branch of the Liberal Party received upwards of $500,000 in donations uh, from Chinese interests. She's received iPads, uh, she's re received accommodation um, and flights, and she's the foreign minister uh, of the nation. So the question should, could, could also be asked uh, whether or not her positions have been compromised in respect of these donations um, So that's, as well. uh, that's a safe for Sam Dastyari then? Pardons? That means he's uh, safe in your eyes, Sam Dastyari? As I said, he, he's, he's broken no rules. He's done the right thing and disclosed the donation uh, in his pecuniary interest register. He's made an explanation um, to the Senate. So there's been no breach of the rules here. OK, uh, I want to move on, if I can, the uh, Medicare benefit schedule review. We're getting details of an interim report. It talks about doctors identifying various elements of waste, in particular waste of their time. Michael Suker, this sounds like the sort of review perhaps and way to save money and health that should have happened from the start maybe instead of the first reaction of uh, simply uh, slapping on a GP co-payment. Well Tom, I, look I think uh, you know, the MBS is 21 billion dollars. Uh, I think it's incumbent on any government to look at how we could most efficiently provide those services and uh, as I was reading this morning in The Australian, I mean, it sounds like uh, a lot of the calls to review the MBS have come from the medical profession themselves, uh, presumably because they're on the front line and they understand uh, where we can perhaps make, um, make changes to ensure that we're getting the best bang for our buck. But look, as sure as night follows day, uh, if we make and uh, if we propose any changes in health, uh, Labor will come out and say we're gutting the healthcare system, where they'll run a, a tawdry campaign like Medi-Scare. Uh, but we, I think, uh, need to do uh, the right thing here and, um, 
and listen to the medical profession and see where we can make efficiencies, not to take the money out of health, but to just make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck. And as I said, $21 billion, we want to be making sure we, we're spending every dollar on the most efficient services that can be delivered by our healthcare professionals. <laughs> Matt Thistlethwaite, a chance for you to prove Michael Suka wrong here. It was interesting reading this because I think people would have experiences of both sides of this. You sit in a surgery, you pay for an expensive appointment simply to get a two-line sick note. It might be a referral onto a specialist after a one-minute appointment. There is surely an efficiency or efficiencies to be found within this sort of system. This comes from a regular MBS review which Labor supports. Uh, we need to see the details obviously but I think the one takeout, Tom, from the federal election recently is that uh, the Australian public won't cop undermining the universality of Medicare. And if this is an approach by the government uh, to introduce some sort of co-payment by stealth or to undermine that important universality of Medicare, then Labor, part, the Labor certainly won't cop that um, and will campaign against it. But as I said at the beginning, we've only just received um, the details of this and we'll look through them and make a decision in due course. All right, we'll see where all that ends up. We're going to take a quick break now on AIM Agenda. Back with more and the panel after this. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Our political panel today is Michael Suker, the Liberal MP, and also Matt Thistlethwaite, the Shadow Assistant Minister for the Treasury. Gentlemen, I'll turn the focus now to uh, education. We spoke about health before the break. The other bigger election issue Labor wanted there to be was education. And Matt Thistlethwaite, a report out today from the Productivity Commission that says we're spending $10 billion extra, this is across all governments, uh, in 2013-14 compared to the previous or a decade previously, uh, and yet results have either stalled or gone a little bit backwards. This shows, doesn't it, that it's not simply about tipping cash into the system? Well, Labor's never said that it's simply about additional investment. It's also about better targeting resources and that's what Labor's proposed policy was all about. That's what the Gonski report indicated was required in Australia, that you need to better target resources to areas where kids are particularly struggling on literacy and numeracy. So it's a sector neutral approach. It's not based on um, giving more money to public schools and taking it off other schools. It's purely based on the needs of kids and we think that that's the right approach to take. Um, it's early days, yes, and in the areas where the Gonski model has been working, and I think it's, it's reasonable to point out that not all of the states and territories have signed up to the model, but in the areas where the Gonski model has been uh, implemented, we ha are seeing improvements in results, particularly where teachers have been given additional resources to target kids that are falling behind, and that's the focus okay. of the Gonski model. It's not only additional investment, but better targeted investment. We'll see where the government goes on its next deal. Michael Suker, I'd like to get your thoughts on what ended up happening on Friday. There was a Liberal Party executive meeting and there has been this 10-year deal, a plan to have by the end of that 10 years, 50% of Liberal MPs to be female. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Tom, I uh, obviously wasn't privy to the executive meeting. Uh, look, I think uh, we've been making steps uh, as a party, particularly the Victorian division for many years, to make it uh, certainly more friendly and uh, to get to ensure that more women are pre-selected uh, and ultimately that more women become uh, MPs at a federal or a state level. We are, though, a thoroughly democratic party, so it's not as easy as our uh, executive, whether it be a state or federal executive, just simply saying, well, here are the numbers of women that must be pre-selected because we're a thoroughly democratic party and our members decide ultimately who's pre-selected. But I uh, would encourage uh, all of the leadership of our party, including the federal executive, to look at ways that we can inc increase female uh, participation in the party, not just uh, in the parliamentary side of the party, but throughout our party. Because one thing we know in the Liberal Party is that the more women that are involved and engaged at a grassroots level uh, ultimately equates to more women being pre-selected and, and therefore more women uh, being elected to parliament. So I'm pretty comfortable okay, with it. But I, think our, I think our party has to reflect our society and women are a, a tick over 50 per cent of that. So um, I'd be very comfortable uh, with uh, certainly aspirations to get to that point. 
This sounds more than aspirational, though. This is a 10-year plan to have 50% representation. That doesn't really fit, does it, with your description of a thoroughly democratic party? Well, I think there's nothing wrong with having a pretty thorough, rigorous roadmap in place uh, to get to the point that we want to, and that's to have more women uh, involved in our parliamentary party. And uh, rather than just sort of wishing that it happens, uh, I would expect that the leadership of uh, our, the, our party um, come up with a process that's rigorous uh, and that gives us the best ability to achieve the objective. So I'm pretty comfortable with it, Tom. I think, uh, I think most Liberal Party members would be as well, but uh, I would make the distinction. We, we are a very democratic party and uh, no single individual will be able to, with a stroke of a pen, uh, suddenly uh, increase that participation. So it must be done organically throughout the party. Okay. Matt Thistlethwaite, turning the attention to superannuation, the Grattan Institute described as the parliament that it would be irredeemably flawed if it couldn't get agreement on this, given we've got this broad agreement for some time now from all three of the major parties, if you like, or the two majors and the Greens. Um, is Labor really going to work cooperatively here? Because you've put up one suggestion, it's been rejected. You will wait, presumably, to see what Scott Morrison comes up with. Well, I know what is irredeemably flawed Tom, and that's the Liberal Party and this government, and that's highlighted by their approach to superannuation. They announced this policy on budget night back in May. They still haven't delivered the legislation because Scott Morrison can't get it through his own party room. Uh, they're completely divided and at war with each other when it comes to the issue of superannuation. Labor offered two weeks ago, Bill Shorten offered at the press club, a compromise arrangement um, that would have seen this legislation potentially passed through the parliament last week. It was a, a, a robust approach that we think will raise additional funding for the budget, but importantly tackle those high income tax concessions, and it was rejected out of hand. So we need to see the details of what the government's proposing. So far there's nothing because they can't get it through their party room. Michael Suka reports Scott Morrison's going around and assuring Liberal MPs that uh, there are some changes, this will be palatable. What's he telling them? Well, what uh, the Treasurer is saying publicly and privately is the same, and that is uh, that we took uh, a suite of policies to the election. We now have a mandate to implement those. Uh, there are always implementation issues associated with legislation, and uh, basically you'd expect him to be consulting widely in the development of that legislation. And let's just remember, we were just back for... This is the f just previous sitting week, was the first week uh, sitting since the budget, and. Uh, we won't take any lectures from Labor because they had an utterly embarrassing position at the election where, for the purposes of their policy costings, they banked the savings associated with our superannuation me measures but didn't outline a policy themselves. So I can tell you right okay, now, we well, won't take any lectures from Labor and neither will the Australian people as far as superannuation right, we'll, we'll policy see, goes. We'll see where they end up, but can I ask you as well, Tony Abbott uh, has told uh, or said to Scott Morrison in a meeting that... Uh, he was uh, not happy with the, the supplement for low-income earners on superannuation, wanted to reserve the top end instead. Is there much appetite to go back to that sort of mix amongst uh, backbenchers? Well, look, I'm not privy to any conversations that uh, the Treasurer and uh, the former PM have had together. Uh, I, as I say, uh, have said publicly, uh, I agree with the Treasurer. We took a suite of policies to the election now, there's nothing wrong with making sensible tweaks to those um, post-consultation with uh, either colleagues uh, or, or um, relevant stakeholders in the industry, uh, but I would expect that the broad structure of the reforms as announced on budget night will be uh, the structure of reforms that we ultimately legislate. So that's my okay. position, and I therefore wouldn't expect any wholesale changes in the, the respect that... Uh, You've just outlined. We'll see where we'll see where those tweaks end up. Michael Suka, Matt Thistlethwaite, thanks for your time this morning on the program, Jeez, and stay Tom. with us on Thanks, Sky Tom. News Live. More coming up after the break.